Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Very good evening. Welcome to another edition of Health Matters in this beautiful city of Johannesburg. And looking at the world and what is happening around it, the focus is Antibiotic Week. I'm Khawa Solomon. Welcome to it. And for the next hour or so, please do stay with us as we touch on antibiotics, something commonly used when you often go to the doctor. And sometimes people are getting over the counter, so we'll, we'll, we'll crack that question as well um, when the doctor is not involved. But in studio, we have our specialists answering your questions as well, so don't forget to interact with us. And if you are calling in, please, please turn down your television set. Get to a nice spot where you have a lovely connection so we can hear your questions. And also your friends and families, if they're listening to us across the lands and over the beautiful seas, they can tune on in to itvnetworks.tv and live stream any of our shows. Assalamu alaikum to our specialist in studio, Dr. Mohammed Said, And of course, from the IMA, we welcome their team, always willing and able uh, providing us their time and expertise, Dr. Yaqub. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. So, um, Dr. Mohammed said, before we quick kick off with you, a uh, clinical microbiologist, um, love your little story, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, if we can start with you, Dr. Yaqub, just to give us a sort of introduction to the show Antib Antibiotic Awareness Week. What is this, this drug all about? Well, antibiotics very well known. Most people have probably use antibiotics at some point in their life or mm. for their children or families. It's basically a drug, a medicine that's made either in a tablet or a liquid formulation or an IV uh, to fight bacteria. And mm. I think we need to understand that. So antibiotic is a drug that is meant to fight a specific bacteria, a bacterial infection. Mm -hmm. And we need to differentiate that from other agents which are antivirals, mm. which fight viral infections and antifungals okay. which are fungal infections and those are very specific type of infections that occur. Okay. The most common uh, infections generally that we encounter are viral ones which don't mm. require antibiotics and I think we'll uh, unpack that, all yeah. that as we go along with uh, Mohammed inshallah. And often you hear, no, but you've got a virus, you know, yeah. so what does that mean? Yeah. And with you, uh, Dr. Mohammed, let's uh, quickly hear your story because going back to just n not the, uh, the picture that you're painting here, yeah, clinical microbiologist, you've also been a medical doctor in practice? Yes, I started off uh, after I graduated. I was in private practice for mm -hmm. about five years. Okay. I had an interest in uh, travel medicine and vaccinations. And coincidentally, it's a pleasure for me today to share the studio or share the platform with my ex-boss, oh, uh, Dr. Isaac, where I worked I didn't at his know practice as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Brilliant uh, stuff. Following so. that, I then uh, moved know. on to Pretoria, where I specialize as a clinical microbiologist. And I'm currently based at the University of Pretoria Department of Medical Microbiology. Okay, so shukran for making the trek to it's our studios here in Santon. We appreciate it. And as the, uh, the, the, the pathologist, the, the person that understands what's happening with bacteria and in the blood, explain to us what the sort of um, makeup of an antibiotic is and are there different kinds? Okay, so uh, yes, antibiotics are a class or a group of medicines that target bacteria in particular. Mm. So they fight off bacterial infections. There are many classes of antibiotics and they differ by the way in which they um, recognize bacteria. Okay. So for example, we get the common one, which uh, I'm sure the viewers and yourself are aware of, it's penicillin. Yes. So that is a class of antibiotic known as a beta-lactam. So, th and, and like that, there are many different classes of antibiotics mm. and they recognize bacteria by re recognizing different structures on the bacterial cell. Mm. Uh, furthermore, we can also differentiate bacteria or antibiotics from narrow spectrum and broad spectrum. Mm. So narrow spectrum, they yeah, will target a specific group or narrow spectrum of bacteria, mm -hmm. whereas broad spectrum, they target a much wider range of bacteria. Mm. So, uh, Dr. Jakub, uh, in practice as a family uh, practitioner, what are the most commonly prescribed um, antibiotics and how are they meant to be used? Okay, so the most commonly ones are the penicillin still, I think, okay. Mohamed. Uh, and the most famous ones that most patients are aware of and viewers, uh, in the old days, they were actually, the older generation will actually be able to identify that the doctor used to do the house call and always come and give them a penicillin injection. Yes. Okay. Right. So those are still the most common ones. Mm -hmm. There are different types of penicillins, but the most common one that is known to most viewers is the amoxicillin. amoxicillin. And the other one, okay. I'll mention a brand name saying Augmentin, but 
basically it is a combination of two antibiotics, mm. amoxiclav and clavulinic acid. And those are the very famous, well-known ones. But there are a whole lot of other ones. Uh, what we do find is uh, uh, there's a certain number of people and, and patients that are allergic to the penicillins. Okay. And then, therefore, they would then get an alternative. Uh, then there's a whole lot of other classes. There mm. are the cephalosporins and then there's the macrolides. So we don't want to get into all the technical terms mm. of that because we just want to disseminate information. Okay. So those are the most commonly ones that are prescribed. What we do find, obviously, is that there is a big problem and globally in Nash, uh, is an overuse of antibiotics. Okay. And the inappropriate use of antibiotics. antibiotics. So many people would come in and we find this, especially parents, when a child gets a fever, mm. uh, they panic and they obviously want the fever to come down. And the first thing they ask for, besides the, the panado or the, the drug that will bring down the, the fever, fever, is please give my child an antibiotic. antibiotic. And it's an understanding that we have to create that, you know, the most common infection when you just get a fever, especially in children, it usually mm. is a viral, and even in adults. And there are a whole lot of symptoms and signs that we go mm. through to kind of differentiate at a clinical level. Obviously, if you're going to want to do things properly every time, you then have to find out the source of the infection okay. and then do a testing. Yeah. But testing takes a while. Yeah. So sometimes you have to obviously intervene just, earlier. Yeah. Okay. So that's mm. a broad... Uh, framework of where antibiotics fall in. So they fall into a category of infections. Okay. And the common infections in practice we see are respiratory infections. Okay. So people have a flu or flu-like symptoms mm. and says, can I get an antibiotic? Why am I not getting an antibiotic? And we need to obviously discuss mm. that because flu usually is a viral yeah. thing. Yes, so th that's going to be <laughs> quite an interesting topic. But <coughs> understanding the misuse and people not un not knowing what it does to our body, just explain um, in your terms when they are prescribed, what, it, what are their functions? We, we understand it's killing bacteria, but what is it doing to our bodies? Okay. So um, one thing that we must understand is that an antibiotics are used appropriately for mm -hmm. bacterial infections. They are very, very effective, mm -hmm. right? The problem comes in when we misuse antibiotics. Um, so your question about what they do, um, there are a number of, 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 of issues with antibiotics. They are not harmless, so mm -hmm. to speak. One of the issues is that, you know, you could get something like allergic reactions to anti antibiotics, right? Uh, commonly people are aware of penicillin allergy. Some people may have a sulfur allergy, and that's mm -hmm. important because a lot of anti uh, some antibiotics have sulfur. Um, the other problem with antibiotics is what we would term collateral damage that they cause. Mm. So I'll give you an example, and an example would be an antibiotic like uh, ciprofloxacin, which belongs to the fluoroquinolone class of antibiotics. Okay. What, what happens with ciprofloxacin, commonly used in, in general practice as well, mm. um, it also has collateral damage to, for example, tendon rupture joint problems. Mm. It affects the rhythm of your heart, how the heart beats. Okay. Uh, it may affect uh, you psychiatrically uh, in resulting in psychosis, etc. In fact, it can affect any organ of the body. And mm. for this reason, we find that in uh, places like Europe, um, recently, they've completely withdrawn the fluoroquinolones and uh, you will not find them there. Okay. Because of the side but effects. Having said that, it's a still a very effective drug. Yes. As long as you sure. know when you're going to use it. Mm. But the one thing we have to emphasize to people is when they see the doctor, and sometimes they are encountering a busy practitioner, mm -hmm. and they have to always remind the treating physician or doctor, whoever is treating them, if they have an allergy. Okay. Right? Because sometimes the allergy is written on top of the file. Mm. Doctor is on page three or page four yes, of his yes. file. And he doesn't Just always say there may be a locum or a partner mm. associate. Right. So people must always mention if they know that they have an allergy. Okay. And then again, it doesn't always mean that if they had some kind of reaction in the past, that they have an allergy. Mm. So they have to understand that too. So if they documented allergy, yes. If it's undocumented, they must discuss it with their practitioner. Okay. As far as the quinolones concerned, I mean, there are many, many alternatives to that. So again, uh, it's something that uh, the practitioner must be aware of. And one other thing is, if you're taking other drugs, mm -hmm. there's a lot of drug interactions, like uh, Dr. Sayed said, that basically the rhythm of the heart with the quinolones. There are so many chronic patients with heart conditions that are on multiple drugs, mm. they have to mention this, and they have to be aware of this. Especially when people now, we are traveling, mm. holiday season, they must take a list of their medicines with them, and they've got to make 
the, the attending health uh, care worker aware of what they have so then the appropriate antibiotic is given when required. Okay, so we want to talk about uh, bacteria and virus, but we've got a minute to air, so, uh, to air break, so I know that takes definitely longer than a minute, but just quickly explain sort of the use, what we need to know about antibiotics. Uh, you've mentioned some of the side effects of one of the antibiotics um, that has been stopped in Europe. Um, just quickly run through some information, safe time to take it, storage, um, if there are any side effects of some. Okay, so um, what I can advise is that uh, when you are prescribed an antibiotic, mm -hmm. you should stick to the timing and the dose that has been given to you. Mm -hmm. So there's a reason why you've been asked to take an antibiotic before meals or after meals. Sometimes okay. if you t if certain antibiotics, they work better or they have better bioavailability mm -hmm. when they are taken with food. Others, to mitigate side effects, they may be prescribed after meals so you don't have gastritis and stomach problems, etc., okay. etc. Also, very important to stick to the dose of the antibiotic that's been prescribed. If you underdose antibiotics, this is when the bacteria now start getting, uh, what we, uh, to put it simply, used to this antibiotic, oh, and that antibiotic doesn't, doesn't work, work anymore. anymore. Okay. Alternatively, you're going to double the dose that has been prescribed. Mm -hmm. You may cause damage to certain organs of the of the body, example, your kidneys. Mm. So listen to doctor. We want to also talk about the, 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 the safe place to keep your antibiotics and where to keep medicines also. Some people have this tendency of putting it in the fridge. Are we, are we on the same wavelength or not? But we'll talk more on Antibiotic Awareness Week just after this. Stay with us. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back, a very good evening. This is ITV Networks Channel 347 on our DSTV platform. And of course, if you're listening to us, watching us rather, over the beautiful lands and across the seas, it is on ITVNetworks.tv. If you've missed any of the Health Matters show or any of the shows on ITV, join our YouTube channel, ITV Networks, and then search for that Health Matters show. We've done over 100 successfully, alhamdulillah, Health Matters shows, so lots of information out there with regards to medical and uh, just general social medical information as well. With us today we have specialists as we highlight Antibiotic Awareness Week and we have the gentleman dealing with it most of the time, um, handing it out to patients and knowing what's going on and then the guy that sits behind the, se the scenes seeing the bacteria and the bloods um, and what it's doing to the medicines and what the medicines is doing to it. So understanding uh, sort of in a technical term and what's happening in real time, we appreciate your expertise coming on board. I I want to just quickly, before we continue, you know, breaking down um, what is happening out there with regards to antibiotics, why do you think antibiotics need this awareness campaign? Okay, so I think the biggest problem is the overuse or the abuse of antibiotics. Okay. And, and what's happening is that, as we've mentioned before, that when antibiotics or bacteria are exposed to antibiotics, mm they tend to get used to those antibiotics. Those antibiotics don't work anymore. Mm. And hence, we get, we, we're sitting with this problem of antibiotic resistance, which is a major public health threat. Sure. Uh, Dr. Yakub, explain to us now the difference between the bacteria and virus. Well, there's different types of germs. Mm. So bacteria is a particular shape and a particular formulation, and a virus has a particular shape and a particular formulation, and so a fungus. Mm. So viral infections, which are the more common ones presenting when patients come in general practice we're talking about, mm. uh, and I'm not talking about specialist practice and hospital, uh, so on, at a family uh, medicine level or even at a primary care level at the clinics, mm. most of the Current uh, presentations are viral when you're looking at the respiratory tract infections, either sinusitis, rhinitis. So those are when you have got running nose or uh, allergies of mm. some sort and uh, sore throats. So even sometimes people have a tonsillitis. Yeah. Still, even with a tonsillitis, the viral one is the mm. first one usually. Okay. And, and then later you may get a secondary bacterial infection. Okay. And then there is a category of patients who are immune suppressed for whatever reason, mm. and they are more likely to get the bacterial infection. So the, the doctor or the treating physician will be aware of that. Mm. 
uh, that this patient may be compromised. And there are certain common things in our community, like diabetes, one mm. of the most common conditions we find. So they get a fair amount of bacterial infections, mm. but then at the same time, they also get other infections. Okay. So it has to be worked through. Mm. So there is a difference between the germs. Antibiotics, which we're talking about today, work against bacteria, bacteria. as Dr. Sayed has explained. So but I just want to ask our learned colleague here one sure. other question. is We spoke about the inappropriate use, misuse, right? But there is a chronic use of antibiotics. Right, Marvin, for example, the dermatologists and GPs still use a lot of antibiotics for acne mm -hmm. over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So what is your view on that? Because patients will ask, look, I, my acne is now cleared up after three months with, for example, Bactrim or doxycycline. Mm -hmm. Can I continue? Is it safe? Uh, what are the monitoring mechanisms mm -hmm. and wh what are the safety risks? Okay. Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, what I think is important in that situation is that those antibiotics are usually used at a lower dose uh, and they used at less frequency. So we may not give them three times a day or every it's six hours. Daily. It's usually a daily and it's a much lower dose. Uh, dose. Yeah. And uh, uh, you can follow up patients by looking at, uh, you, you know, once in a, couple, a month or two months, uh, do certain bloods, just check the kidney function, the liver function, etc. And uh, I think you should be, should be fine. Okay. So, so Dr. Mohammed, back at the lab, what uh, does bacteria and viruses really mean to you guys, for <laughs> us to understand? Okay, so um, although both of them cause infectious disease mm. in humans, um, I think one of the things that I want to touch on for the purposes of this discussion is with regard to their structure. Okay. So if you look at viruses, a virus is essentially has a core a uh, bit of genetic material in the form of DNA or RNA, mm -hmm. and then it's surrounded by a protein shell, and it may have an envelope, and that's about it. Okay. Whereas bacteria, you find, is much more structured. So they mm -hmm. have a cell wall, they have a cell membrane, they have different organelles within them, they've got DNA, they've got RNA, much larger and much oh. more structured. So that's important because, as uh, Dr. Isaac has also mentioned, Antibiotics will recognize certain structures of the bacteria, and that is why they work for bacterial infection. Mm. The, those structures are not present in viruses. Okay. So henceforth, okay. antibiotics have no effect against viruses. So bacteria is a bit more involved. Yes. Because a virus isn't. But both can cause significant disease. Correct. And you have to understand that. So while we're talking about, and this is another important point, we have a large or a, a community out there okay. that don't want to use any medication. Yes, no, we're going to get to that okay, question yeah. as well. Yeah. Remember, we are taking your calls live here on Health Matters. Assalamu alaikum. Do you have a question for our doctors? Chief, welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Very well, Hamza. Go ahead, sir. Um, two questions. I hear them talking one about antibiotic resistance. Could okay. you give a sense of what the resistance is worldwide in a moment and and the uh, development of new antibiotics. Are there new antibiotics in the last five or ten years that are around? Okay. Secondly, there are many, many, many people who just go and buy antibiotics over the counter at pharmacy. Yes. And uh, what is the advice of the panel to those people? Thank you, sir. We appreciate your call. Okay, so All the questions that are coming up. <laughs> so we'll start with the second question. Mohit can answer the first one. Um, the the, the over-the-counter yeah. purchase of antibiotics. Yes. It's a very dangerous practice. Mm -hmm. uh, again, people get away with it because often the infection is viral mm. and uh, wow. they are going to get it's better gonna anyway. Yeah. The immunity is going to work. Uh, the antibodies, that the defense mechanism that Allah has given us mm. is going to work. So they're under the false notion that the antibiotic has helped it's them. Working, right? yeah. But you are promoting and creating resistance because now, as Mohammed has explained, uh, inappropriate use causes resistance. And at times you may be allergic. And then the thing is, if you even have an, a bacterial infection, but if it's not the correct one, mm. then you're going to prolong your infection. Okay. Um, we're going to hold your answer for that just for a minute. We're going to go to our next caller. This is Health Matters. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, alaikum to the panel there. Um, I've just got a question. Yeah. About about two weeks ago, my daughter was diagnosed with a virus infection. Okay. And um, they just they had her on a on an antibiotic drip mm -hmm. for about three days, and um, her temperature was just going up after she's been discharged. Okay. Last Sunday again, 
another temperature of 40. Mm-hmm. And she's currently now still in hospital, so they're doing some tests. Once again, to see what bacterial virus it is. Okay. So maybe if the panel could just um, assist me. I know there's a doctor, but just um, yeah. with uh, sure. what, what could be done. Okay. Do you have any questions for the caller? Okay. Shukran so much, sir. We appreciate your question. We will answer it on screen. Shukran, Wa well, Remember, if you're calling us, that was a perfect caller there. The uh, television set is down. They found a perfect spot uh, to get the right connection and we could hear him nice and clear. Uh, Dr. Mohammed said. Okay, should we get, go to the second so caller? So let's, let's just go, go quickly. Yeah. Okay. And then we'll come back. So we'll the, come back to the first one. With part. regard to, to, to that, I mean, obviously we need, to, I think there's more investigations that needed there mm. because... Uh, we need to find out whether this fever that the, the, the patient is suffering from, it could be a non-infectious cause or it could be an infectious cause. Mm -hmm. So we need to start off there. Is it an infection or is it something else? Yeah. If it is a suspected infection, and even, 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 uh, they, even for a fever, they should investigate. So they should look for the source of the infection. So where mm -hmm. is it coming from? Is it from the chest? Is it from the, something in the abdomen? Uh, is it something in the bladder, something in the kidneys? So this child needs appropriate investigations in the form of uh, sending specimens to the lab, to us, for example, okay. where we can grow up and see what bugs there are, okay. or further investigations to see if it is a non-infectious cause of that mm -hmm. fever. So you mentioned bacterial virus. Two different things that we were just speaking yeah, about, so but I now the they're together. That asked the question. He, yeah. he said he was told that his child or family yeah. had a viral infection, but was on antibiotics. So again, it, there needs to be some clarity. That yeah. He may have had a viral infection, okay. to my understanding. Subsequently, he may have had a bacterial. Yeah. So obviously, they may have cultured something, and the fact that it's a recurring fever, they've got to differentiate whether it's still an infection. Mm -hmm. or another cause for fever. Okay. Because not all fevers are caused by germs. Mm. There are other conditions that cause fevers. So obviously it'll be depending on what's going on in that hospital and the fact that she's been readmitted, uh, that means there's something happening on a prolonged level mm. and they need to determine the cause. And as Mohammed said, they will then take the blood, they will send it to the lab. And in the lab, what they do is, Marwood knows, that they will obviously do the culture and sensitivity. We just need to explain that too. Okay. So what they do is they identify the germ, and they also identify a whole lot of panel of antibiotics which work against that germ. Yeah. And then they give the report back to the treating health practitioner that these are the germs uh, that are prevalent, mm -hmm. and these are the antibiotics that work, and these are the antibiotics that don't work. So are they growing the germ yeah, and, and then using mm -hmm. each antibiotic to see which one works the yeah. best? Yeah, yes. yeah so what matching it up. we, 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 we would up. grow it okay. up uh, on special plates, okay. uh, and once we have that bacteria, then we test them against a whole panel of antibiotics, which, and then we can give you a report, this antibiotic will work, this won't work, so it can guide the practi medical practitioner. And what is what the timeline use. around that? Uh, he's talking back and forth, his daughter. Yeah, so, so that is the issue with, with the so-called culturing technique. Mm. It takes two to three days to get a full report, even more depending on the bacteria we're dealing with. Oh. So that is a shortcoming. So the patient has to suffer and wait. And okay. they, they also identify if the patient has already got antibiotic in the system. Okay. So they'll be able to make you aware that, listen, there is this antibiotic mm. that is currently there that has already been prescribed, yeah. and whether you should continue using that or change course. Okay. We talk more on antibiotics and specifically with our caller one. Antibiotic resistance, more on that just after the short break. Back in a moment. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Thank you so much for staying with us as we talk about antibiotics. The common use of it, misuse of it is uh, some, th some of the things that has come up and antibiotic resistance from our last caller that we just got uh, before the, the break, uh, Dr. Mohammed. Let's deal with his question. He's worried about antibiotic resistance as you've mentioned previously in the show. Okay, so I, I think his question was more regarding the um, rates of anti antibiotic resistance. Okay. Um, that differs a lot depending upon the prescription practices of doctors in, in, in the setting where you, where you are. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in the uh, US, they've got extremely high rates of resistance in a lot of their 
bacteria mm. and that is because of their overuse and misuse of antibiotics whereas you look at a place like the Netherlands mm -hmm. very very low antibiotic resistance because they are very very cautious uh, when prescribing antibiotics they hardly ever prescribe it mm. in our setting it will again depend on where you are are you in a are we look at private sector public sector for some reasons we find that higher resistance in the private sector as compared to the public sector but overall antimicrobial or antibiotic resistance is on the increase everywhere. Mm. Okay, so uh, Dr. Yaku... There's a second part to that question you mm -hmm. wanted to know about newer drugs. Yes, uh, yes, that's for right, those things, For the development okay. of that. Thing. So, uh, mm. this is a problem with antibiotic resistance, mm. is that the pipeline of newer antibiotics is very slow. And um, the reason for that may be that pharmaceutical companies, you know, they probably do not want to invest in an antibiotic research and development because, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, they rather focus on, some, on developing the chronic medications which you're going to use okay, chronically. Mm -hmm. So that development is slow. There are antibiotics in the pipeline, but they're in various trials, and it may still take a while before we can actually use them in clinical practice. Okay. So earlier on, Dr. Yakub, we mentioned about storage, and we were chatting about some of the meds that are kept in the fridge. I know commonly we were given at the clinic this uh, pink powder mixed with water, and they say, you know, keep it in the fridge. But I've come across, across the pharmacist who has also mentioned, you know, why do we, why do we keep medicines in the fridge. So just talk to us about that. Okay, so Barbara touched on research and development with clinical trials. Mm -hmm. So when they're doing these trials, they actually test which is the optimal temperature at which a reconstituted medicine will work. Mm. And that is generally the powder formulations. The oral okay. the tablet formulation or capsules, usually the storage instructions are below 25 degrees yeah. and it's all on the box. We the, don't usually read the box. <laughs> yeah, but th that's important. You see? Yes. So, it's, so uh, the, both the patient and doctor must take responsibility yeah. for this or the nurse and, and say, look, you know, this is the storage temperatures. Mm. We're going through, undergoing a heat wave at the moment. Yes. So we have to be very careful where we store our medicines at home. Okay. Because that then determines and actually affects the efficacy, mm. the effectiveness of the drug. Okay. And again, people must also understand that when the instruction is there after reconstitution, uh, between two and eight degrees is usually with the, with the powder formulations, the ones you're speaking about. Mm. The temperature in the fridge is also different. So the temperature oh, yes. inside the fridge and the door is different, mm. right? And then some people make the mistake, they actually put it into the freezer, which is a problem now because it's well below two degrees. No, it's really not going to work. Right. Yeah. So they must follow the instructions. And then even when they're reconstituting, you know, sometimes people just pour water into the thing, mm. the powder shoots out. So again, that's affected. Mm. Uh, they have to be careful how they do that. And then and some of them are now marked, the, the newer bottles nowadays okay. compared to 10, 15 years ago, where the water should go up to what level. Mm. But then again, they're quite uh, accurate instructions on the box, okay. whether it's 67 mils or 50 mils, it varies with the antibiotic. Okay. So storage instructions must not be taken lightly mm. because it affects the actual efficacy and then the response to that infection when you're giving it. Exactly. So you want to get medicine that's actually working for you. Mm -hmm. We are taking your calls. Remember, this is Antibiotic Awareness Week. And any questions around that, we have our specialist in studio, Dr. Mohamed Said, as well as Dr. Yakub. Um, looking at animal resistance, again, antibiotics, the questions around when I was Googling, they were talking about antibiotic use in animals. What does that mean to us that are consuming these meats? Okay, so that's uh, something that's very topical uh, yeah. question that you're asking there. Um, and in recent times, there's this concept that has come up of one health. Mm. And what that means is basically, you know, where human health, environmental health, and animal health, particularly domesticated animals or food, animals in the food production system, mm. all of them are linked together and it depends on, or, or, or it has an effect on one another, mm. these spheres. So, um, as an example, there are certain antibiotics, and this has been going on for quite a while, unrestricted in this country here, where they're using you said unrestricted, unrestricted okay. use of antibiotics being fed to animals. Okay. Not because they're sick, but in order to fatten these animals up. To so, there's a growth, Go, yeah, it's, it's a growth factor, along with mm. your other hormones in it. They've been giving these a a animals antibiotics to get the maximum weight in these animals. What that has done is that the bacteria that are found in these animals mm -hmm. have become resistant to those antibiotics that they are being fed. 
And because this in the food chain, we find that even in human isolates, so bacteria and humans as well, are resistant to those very same antibiotics that were fed to, to the animals. So it definitely has an effect on us. Okay. Um, so that comes with you, Dr. Yakub, giving, med you know, prescribing medication, the antibiotic to the patient. Is this sort of a timeline that you're saying, let me know in a day or two if this antibiotic is not working and possibly that would be the reason. What is the timeline and what people should know? Well, it's based on what's happening to them. Mm. Some infections take a bit longer to respond. Okay. So we, patients can call us back. Uh, we will tell them that, look, you got a throat infection. Mm. The average time will be such and such for that particular thing. Or you've got a urinary tract infection. Let's check the urine again if you still got symptoms. So it's again based on the clinical scenario. Okay. The usual case, the average case, usually is between three to seven days. Okay. And I just want to bring up this other point now that we're talking about that. Mm -hmm. So there is a drug now that's been around for a few years now where it's one antibiotic for three days. Whereas the older generation was used to this five-day course of yeah, six seven, tablets yeah. a day. Now people have this notion that if you're giving this one tablet for three days, you're giving me a stronger antibiotic. Antibiotic. Okay. So when they come to you and they say, you know what, why don't you just give me that strong one first time? Why are you giving me this yes. prolonged five-day thing and easier to take? So they have to understand that you have to give the correct antibiotic mm. for the correct infection and the appropriate match mm. has to be created. So there's no such a thing as a stronger antibiotic. It's stronger based on the bacteria and the bacterial count and the mm. culture. So it's a whole... A uh, lot of factors because, that are to I be mean, taken into account. Yeah, so, so my understanding also that you get stronger antibiotics, the bigger amoxyl, this bigger tablet now that's going to work That's a higher better. dose, yeah. Okay. So it's again based on Older, what you're treating. Higher dose, okay. Yeah, but I mean, you see again, for example, a tablet may be a 500 milligram, mm. but there's another one that's a 400 milligram. You mm -hmm. can't compare the no. two like that because okay. they're from a different class, class. Okay. which is what we started off initially when Mohamed mentioned the different classes of uh, okay. antibiotics. So, Dr. Mohamed, if I can come back to you quickly on the whole um, antibiotics being not restricted in the country and coming to a shelf and you see uh, there are labels that are saying um, organic or not hormone. Is that related to the, 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 um, the antibiotics that's being pumped in some animals? Um, I, I'm assuming you're talking about um, substitutes that we see in the pharmacies? No, oh, no. I'm talking okay. about if you're going shopping Yes. and you find on the shelf where this chicken um, is saying um, organic yeah, okay, or, okay. Or, or not hormone, you know, How chicken. How do you identify whether that yeah. animal is, is that, or is that, that what has been are... fed with antibiotics? Yes. <laughs> Look, it's, it's, it's difficult like to identify <laughs> that, but uh, what yeah, I can do they, say Are they meant to be labelling? Uh, they should be, but what I can say is that uh, in recent times, due to this uh, increase uh, in antimicrobial resistance, which has become a public health problem, mm. the authorities have clamped down and you are no longer allowed to use antibiotics that freely for animal feed. So okay. uh, there, there is some regulation now with that, or, okay. or they are getting tied to with the regulations. But there's labels um, yeah. that are on some foods, hormone-free, yes. organic, is that the better option to take? Uh, I would think so, yes, okay. I would go for those. Okay, all right, so let's um, look at any uh, information from you, Dr. Yakub. what you've mentioned earlier on, what the patient needs to disclose if they're allergic to certain things. When, you, when they're coming to visit and um, you are prescribing the antibiotic, what else do they need to tell you? Well, nothing too much more than that, okay. just that the previous medical history and obviously the current complaint what they've come with. Okay. And if they've taken, and, and uh, obviously we know that they have taken sometimes uh, over-the-counter medication mm. and self-medication, and if they have been given an antibiotic, either by another treating doctor or if they manage to get it over the counter, they should, mm. they should disclose. Okay. They should disclose everything that they're on so that at least we can make a proper assessment of what will be the best and most appropriate intervention. So let's look at the idea of people not wanting to take um, antibiotics. They're being well, prescribed there's, there's it and they choose. There's a move around that. I mean, yeah. look, it's not that you have to take antibiotics, mm. but it's a question of balance. And as Muslims, again, we know we've been taught to go the middle path, right? Mm. And we, we can't be extreme about anything we do. We have to understand that. Mm. So if you are uh, anti-antibiotics, there's nothing wrong with that. But mm. you've got to accept the fact that at some point you may need it and it's for your own benefit. Okay. It's for your own... Uh, uh, to get good health, of, right? Yeah. At the same time, uh, the practitioner 
the treating practitioner mm -hmm. mustn't insist that, listen, if you don't take this antibiotic, you're not going to get better. Mm -hmm. It has to be a discussion based on proper evidence yeah. and, and the most appropriate for that particular clinical scenario at okay. that time. Let's go and pay the bills and get some antibiotics <laughs> if we need it. And uh, if you're being prescribed it, that's what you have to take. But we'll talk about possible options after the break and also the way forward and what's happening in the labs with new technologies just after the stay with us as we highlight antibiotics. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Our last few minutes as we talk about antibiotics. We have Dr. Sayed, uh, Mohammed Sayed, our microbiologist, clinical microbiologist, and our general practitioner, Dr. Yaqub. Shukran so much, gentlemen, for being with us. So uh, just before the break, we touched on the idea of not taking antibiotics. Let's find out if there are other options when choosing not to take um, that prescribed drug to make you better. Are there substitutes, uh, Dr. Mohammed? Okay, from my point, I do accept that there are a lot of compounds or substances that have potent antibacterial activity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we know, for example, something like honey has got potent antibacterial activity. Um, I've heard garlic as well. Yeah. They could be. The, 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 the only shortcoming, and this is an indictment of us as okay. uh, healthcare professionals, yes. particularly Muslim healthcare professionals, yeah. is that we haven't refined what is the uh, formulation of honey to you, for example, or, or that substance. What is the formulation? What is the dose? Yeah. What is the root? What's the frequency? Uh, so there aren't uh, robust clinical trials mm. which have proven this uh, or, or compared it to antibiotics. So. Personally, from where I'm sitting, I'm, um, I would be uncomfortable prescribing that for specifically serious infections. Mm. However, I feel that if you, its use in those type of infections is not exclusive, you should mm. use it in conjunction with your antibiotic. That's my view. Okay. I don't know if you agree. Dr. Well, Yaku. Yeah, or it may not be a bacterial infection because a lot of the diagnosis is made clinically, right? Mm -hmm. So as long as the patient knows the danger signs, if it's getting worse, mm -hmm. especially when you're dealing with the kids and children, when you've got serious conditions mm -hmm. like chest infections, which can be quite devastating. So as long as the discussion is there, mm -hmm. that okay, if you're choosing not to take the antibiotic, although it's our advice in a particular setting, mm -hmm. please, these are the signs, please know that you can go to the ER casualty or contact me if it's getting worse. We understand okay. you're using a substitute. Mm. Also, Mohammed, there are antiseptic agents, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe you just want to explain that. For example, in the throat, uh, the gargles and the sprays. Oh, the sprays and, and stuff. So we oh, cannot always pure antibiotic. antibiotics, but they're local. So the chances of resistance are not that high, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, Correct. and the use of those? Yeah, so those are, are used, but uh, um, again, you know, uh, they, they should be used uh, depending on the seriousness of the infection, mm. uh, with more severe infections, I think it should be coupled with antibiotics. But however, yeah. in milder forms, or if you it feel it's not a mm. uh, 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 bacterial infection, they, they, they could potentially I must, work. I must agree, because amazingly, when you're prescribed an antibiotic, all of that stuff you know, gets better. So you buy that spray and you buy that lozenger or that cough medicine, mm. but the minute you start that course of antibiotics and, and you know you're on the right track, alhamdulillah, all of that does get better. But like we said earlier, sometimes you are going to get better anyway. Yeah. Mm. Right. Also, people must understand uh, another point with antibiotics mm. is the interference with other drugs, which I mentioned earlier. Yes. And a, and a very important one is the contraceptive device, yes. right? I mean, the, the tablets. We're going to talk about uh, uh, yeah. counteracts and uh, yeah. special precautions. So that's so a we'll precaution that they should understand. We do understand as Muslims that obviously only Allah will determine who is born mm. and uh, who, how many people are going to be born, mm. but that we understand. But there are drug interactions. Let's talk about that, special precautions and what counteracts are for antibiotics <laughs> if you are taking something else. Yeah, so, so, so that is a classical example, which is the uh, contraceptive. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, th I think that, that for me is, is one of the, the, the key issues. And, and, and mm. uh, you know, it can work both ways as well, where a certain drug will have an effect on an antibiotic and it results in a lower uh, concentration of the antibiotic in the blood and even vice versa, mm. where the antibiotic will have an effect on the other drug and it lowers that drug's or higher that drug's concentration in the body. So 
we need to be aware, you need to disclose to your doctor okay. what are the tr uh, treatments you're on. So one of the things to take and off then to turn There are off. also special conditions. Okay. So example, when you're going to a dentist and you've had a previous heart condition, yeah. uh, you've got to disclose that because yeah. uh, they may have had a valvular disease, they may have had a prosthetic valve, mm. the risk of infection there with a the dental procedure. Tell the dentist, because their antibiotics will most definitely be prescribed and uh, it's only the right thing to do at the time. So those are called the prophylactic antibiotics. Okay. So you've got to disclose. So it's not always when you're going to a family doctor Definitely. or a GP, but the even at the dentist well. level, and there may be other scenarios also. Okay. So Dr. Yakub, with you, I found um, visiting a GP when you're prescribed an antibiotic, sometimes they would advise you take a probiotic. Why is this? Well, basically, antibiotics kill the normal flora as they kill the, the, the offensive uh, flora, uh, mm. germ. So the normal flora in your gut and that also die with the antibiotic. A common one is, well, we won't take names now, yeah, to yeah. punt anything. So it's patients then experience some form of diarrhea or sometimes they okay, get a, a okay. discharge. Uh, so it's more f as a protection yeah. against that. So it's like a counter effect on the... So issue. Dr. Muhammad, explain to us what is a probiotic makeup? So a probiotic uh, is essentially made up of uh, bacterial cultures. There are certain bacteria. The, the, the common ones is your lactobacillus, your bifidobacterium. You, you may see these and names in the boxes. <laughs> so those are bacteria. Okay. And, and the idea good bacteria? Is, so those are good bacteria, okay. correct? Okay. So the idea mm. is that, remember that antibiotics, as I said, is not harmless. So they will kill off uh, the normal bacteria which are found in our body. And humans have a vast number of bacteria mm. which play a crucial part in your physiology, normal physiology. Mm. And the idea is to replenish those bacteria that, you're, that you are losing through the use of antibiotics, to replenish them with probiotics. So this issue of probiotics is actually a gray area okay. because there is some good evidence to say that it will help with antibiotic-associated diarrhea and uh, thrush, these type of things. Mm -hmm. uh, in other studies, it's been found that uh, it really, you know, I mean, the amount of bacteria that you're losing mm -hmm. or the species of bacteria that you're losing is not really covered by those one or two species that you're adding in. Okay. And other smaller studies have even shown that it, it can actually be dangerous in certain people. For example, somebody is very immunocompromised. So let's take an example of a person on chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. His immune system is very low, and these bacteria can sometimes cause disease in these patients. Although okay. it's uncommon, but so it's contentious are maybe there, um, you know, working. So we'll quickly take a caller. Shukran so much uh, for those that are uh, calling in. We appreciate your interaction, and uh, you may ask your question. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, sir. Uh, I just want to find out which antibiotics cause the erectile dysfunction uh, uh, that Okay, so last week we did the men's health. That didn't come up so appropriately now. What, uh, what is the answer to that? Um, specifically, I don't know of any on the top of my head that would cause uh, erectile dysfunction. Side effects, yeah. okay. Yeah. Nothing just yet. Not, not, not that, not, that, not, not that it's, uh, no, it doesn't. But I mean, yeah. the question must come from somewhere, you know, yeah. the fear yeah. of that. So, okay. So maybe just uh, investigate, uh, the caller can investigate a little bit more and then you can email us at healthmatters at itvnetworks.tv. So moving on to sort of the way forward and understanding everything evolves. Is there something new uh, that's happening with regards to antibiotics in the world uh, that you okay. live in? <laughs> okay, so, so that's one thing I can highlight is that um, for us to... Um, counter antibiotic resistance. Mm -hmm. We need to be more responsible the way we take antibiotics, the way we prescribe antibiotics, and this is where the pathology services must also play their part. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as we mentioned previously, you know, to culture, you know, to do tests on um, the, the, the bacteria and it takes two to three days. Okay. Uh, and what's happening is that things, there is developments in this field, and I've just brought along this little thing which we call a lab in a, a tin. Yeah. So essentially what this does is that, so this is a newer technology like that it is available. Okay. So it's, oh, okay. it's, it's actually made <laughs> by a French company, it's called the BioFire. So this is just one example of 
okay. some developments. So what happens is that the specimen goes in here of the patient. Okay. This goes into a machine that is then linked to a computer. And within an hour, we can tell you, it can pick up up to 30. you have 30, to open up the... 35, no, it, it, okay. it gets injected in, in here. Okay. And then it goes into a little desktop machine, mm -hmm. which will then do the rest of the lab work. So it's a, virtually a lab in here. Okay. Uh, and in, in... So that would be the cultures, the blood... Yeah, the so, so this is, okay. yeah, the specimen goes in here. Mm -hmm. And within an hour, we can, uh, we can tell you that there are, this is probably viral only, this is bacterial, and it can also tell you whether certain antibiotics will or will not work. The technology is here at the moment. The problem is the cost, but okay. I feel this is the way of the future, and it will get cheaper, and we'll be able to tell doctors much faster what you are dealing with. Is it a virus? Is it a bacteria? And that will guide the use of antibiotics. So it's the machine that does the work? It's the machine that basically is a, is a lab. That's okay. So basically, you don't have to send the sample off to the lab. Oh. You're getting it within an hour. So there's a lot of these things that are developing technology, okay. not only to do with today's topic, is what we call the point of care. Yeah. So, you know, in the past, lots of other tests we had to send to the lab. Yes. We had to wait for the results within a yes. day or two. Yes. You can get many, many tests done now where you can, for example, serious conditions yes. like your, your heart, chest pain, mm. you can get those enzyme levels within an hour, within half an hour. Yeah. Uh, so, so technology is developing at, at, a, at a good pace, sometimes for the good, sometimes mm. for the better, but in this case, obviously a beneficial one. We have to wrap up and we still wanted to bring in the point of vaccination and uh, antibiotics and maybe just in conclusion with regards to that and uh, also informing us where we can find safe lit literature um, when we are finding out about antibiotics. Okay, so a very good point about vaccinations. Mm -hmm. Uh, the old adage is that prevention is better than cure. Mm -hmm. So if you vaccinate against, and there are very safe and effective vaccines against both bacteria and viruses, but if you uh, vaccinate yourself against, let's say, bacterial infection, like the pneumococcal vaccine is an example, okay. you would not get diseases caused by pneumococcus, for example, a pneumonia, meningitis, bloodstream infections. Mm -hmm. If you don't get the infection, uh, you don't need antibiotics, okay. and that lowers antibiotic use. So vaccination, okay. very important. Uh, regarding safe literature, I think there's a lot of literature out there, but we need to be aware of the reputable literature. Mm -hmm. So there are websites that I can think of, like the U US CDC, Centers of mm -hmm. Disease Control, uh, World Health Organization websites. They yes. have very useful information, both for uh, patients as well as for healthcare practitioners. Okay. Dr. Yakub, your concluding comments. I think uh, very important that uh, patients shouldn't put the doctor under pressure for an antibiotic. So then, and this is like a frequent scenario that we find mm. ourselves. I'm not getting better, just give me that antibiotic. Or I've got this illness now, in two days time, my wife is going to have it, so just give me that antibiotic for her because it's going to be the same thing. It's oh, the same no. germ that's floating down. I'm just saying, discuss with your practitioner what yeah. is the best thing to do because while it may be a good thing, mm. at the same time, it's not without risk. We appreciate your time and expertise, Dr. Mohammed, coming the way uh, here to our studios and, of course, to you, Dr. Yakub. Mm. We hope that this show has uh, definitely enhanced your uh, knowledge about antibiotics and uh, please respect your medical doctor if they do give you advice. And remember that there are some myths around antibiotics. Do your proper research and... Uh, Trust your doctor when they give you advice. Stay tuned to next week as we, and also for the, for the month of October, we're looking at, uh, rather November, we're looking at diabetes, uh, diabetes awareness, as well as the holy month of Robil Oh, we're looking at some prophetic medicine information as well. So stay tuned to Health Matters for the next coming weeks. From myself, Hawa Solomon, wassalamu alaikum, and goodbye for now.